welcome to Mental Health Matters. I'm Barbara Myers. On today's show, we're going to focus on using writing to help people living with depression. We're pleased and honored to have two guests to help us explore this topic. Our first guest is Beth Schaefer, who's written a book entitled Writing Through the Darkness, Eating Your Depression, Easing Your Depression with Paper and Pen and who has run a creative writing group for people with mood disorders that meets at Stanford for the last 12 years. Welcome. Thank you very much. And our second guest is Bill Schultz, who is a member of Beth's writing group and will tell us about his experiences in using writing. So welcome, Bill. Beth, I thought I would talk with you a little bit about how writing help people with depression. Can you tell us something about your background and how you discovered that writing was helpful to you in managing the symptoms of depression? Well, when I was in graduate school in my early 20s, I began to experience depression for the first time. Um, and over the years, it, it gradually worsened. After graduate school, I was working as a science and medical journalist and writing, but only writing in a professional realm. Uh, but as my depression continued to, to uh, worsen, I found myself in the hospital and feeling very frustrated and, and very depressed uh, one day. I thought about the idea of writing and maybe journaling. It wasn't something I had done for years and years. Mm -hmm. But I thought about that, and I really wasn't up to writing paragraphs, but I just wrote a list of words about how I was feeling and what I was thinking mm -hmm. and set it aside. And I suddenly felt like, hey, things are a little bit better. You got a little lift. A little lift. I know you've continued in this practice, and, and what kind of psychological benefits do you see? I, ha I have certainly continued um, very enthusiastically for, for years now. Um, I, I went home from that experience and began writing and writing as much as I could, really, for. Mm -hmm. for days and, and weeks on end and have continued that as a regular practice now. Mm -hmm. For me, it, it helps my depression considerably. Mm -hmm. It helps me get out my feelings and get my thoughts more organized. But it also uh, helps the anxiety that comes around the depression itself. Mm -hmm. um, so like if you had to compare it with talk therapy, um, you know, would it is it about the same list than that, or...? or uh, it's, it's a similar thing, I, I, I think. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're pushing yourself to get out some of the things that are bothering you, that are difficult, mm -hmm. uh, what you're experiencing, and to organize it uh, in a way. So it, it's not only cathartic emotionally, but intellectually it helps you to get a better grip on what's going on with yourself. What if somebody is so depressed that they just can't seem to get anything going. How do you get started if you're, if you're really in the depths of depression? How can you well, I get think yourself started? Like if someone else was, someone's watching or something, they wait and they know, gosh, I feel so terrible. I couldn't even get started on this. Right. I think the number one rule for all writers, but uh, I think it especially applies to writers dealing with depression, mm -hmm. is don't wait for the right mood. Don't feel like, oh, I'm not motivated right now. I've got to wait for uh, a moment when I feel like I have inspiration. Just do it. Um, sit down and do it the way you've done anything in your life that's had to be uh, disciplined. If you work out, if you've ever done homework, uh, if you've ever done a job, you need to go and be there. And, and uh, writing is the same way. Even if you don't feel like it. Even if you don't feel like it. And I think 90 some percent of the time, once you get started and get over that first sentence or two, mm -hmm. uh, you're kind of over the hump and things start to get much easier and they flow more easily and become enjoyable even. Okay. Um, I think it's important too to think of, of your writing as a release, as something that um, feels like a relief to do. Mm -hmm. And to look at that page you've filled or that list you've made and feel a sense of accomplishment. Mm -hmm. um, you may not have written a novel in the last 20 minutes, but you, you fill the page. And when you're really depressed, that in itself is a huge accomplishment. Tell us a little bit about 
to the group that you lead at Stanford? Well, after I went home from that initial hospital experience mm -hmm. and began writing and writing, feeling like this was a real help along with my medical treatment, this was very important. Um, I began to wonder, well, could this help other people in similar situations? And I was encouraged by some researchers at Stanford to start a group and give it a try. Um, so just by advertising uh, with flyers around the clinic, I, I got enough people together uh, to give it a try. And it worked very well um, from, from very early on. And we, as you said, have had a group for 12 years now. Mm -hmm. uh, we meet weekly, and these days we tend to have around a dozen people per meeting. Mm -hmm. And the people find it just by advertisements on the wall? Or sometimes, but also through uh, other support groups and newsletters and things as well, and as well as sometimes through their clinicians. What kind of things do you ask people to write about? Well, we write about all sorts of different things, some that deal specifically with depression or with mood disorders, mm -hmm. and others that on the surface don't deal with that at all. Um, so that we start out with a, a warm-up exercise, usually a short exercise where I'll give a topic and we will write for five or ten minutes on that topic. Mm -hmm. And it might, be, um, it might be something that's quite unrelated to depression, at least on the surface, although it's, it's surprising how often that will lead into a discussion of moods nonetheless. Yeah. Um, then we do more of an uh, exploratory kind of writing, and we'll do a couple of exercises where we write a little longer, and we look at um, questions that make us dig a little bit deeper and sometimes have more to do with our depression per se. Mm -hmm. um, for example, how did you feel when you were first diagnosed with depression? Mm -hmm. uh, what would you like to tell a, t a trusted friend about your illness? Mm -hmm. uh, how has your spirituality changed or your spiritual beliefs changed since you were a child mm -hmm. to this time? So that is the sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And then we try to wrap up on a, a positive note. Um, with a reflection type of exercise that is hopefully challenging but um, helps bring people up a little bit if they've gotten uh, into a, a very um, introspective place with the earlier ones. So for a reflection exercise, we might write about uh, describe a mentor you've had mm -hmm. or describe a mysterious thing that's happened to you. Mm -hmm. Uh, what is uh, something that you're proud of, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's the kind of thing that we, we tend to write about. How is this kind of writing you know, the same as or different from therapy? My view is that this kind of writing is therapeutic, mm -hmm. but it's not therapy in the sense of psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. um, it's the same in the sense that it's, it's very healing and can sometimes bring out thoughts and feelings that we hadn't been fully aware of. Mm -hmm. It's different in the sense that the healing often occurs internally or individually um, and sometimes even secretly. Uh, people are not required to read uh, out loud what they've written in the group mm -hmm. and sometimes people uh, find that later what they kept uh, just to themselves, in itself was very healing. Mm -hmm. So uh, the group may not know exactly what's happening, but a lot can be going on for the person mm -hmm. who's writing. Um, I know that you've done a lot of reading about, done research um, about how writing helps people in many different contexts, like AIDS, breast cancer, and so forth. Could you tell us a little bit about studies that have been done? There's been a lot of studies done now, and it's, it's very fascinating to me that writing can help us physically, emotionally, and socially or behaviorally as well. Mm -hmm. The first studies that were done looked at how often people went to the doctor and looked at how, how often they went during a certain period. Mm -hmm. Then people wrote for 15 minutes a day for four consecutive days, that's all. Just 15 mm -hmm. minutes a day for four days. 
and then they were studied for several months. The number of times that they went to the doctor decreased by 40%, so a really significant decrease. Wow. Um, and that was writing about a traumatic experience. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems that looking at difficult experiences uh, can lead to more trauma in our lives, that is having a, a, a abuse or a serious uh, uh, illness or someone near to you dying can lead to issues in our lives, but keeping them secret, keeping a trauma secret seems to be very significant too. Mm -hmm. And by writing about a trauma and getting it out, uh, that difficulty is, is decreased considerably. Mm -hmm. So then people have looked at other populations. Um, you mentioned uh, people with HIV or AIDS. Um, their immune systems actually improve. Their white blood cell count increases. Mm -hmm as a result of that kind of writing. Yeah. Uh, and it's been studied in people with cancer, uh, inmates, veterans, uh, homeless people, a wide variety of people now, and it, and it seems to help, and it seems to help with specifically with depression symptoms as yeah. well, looking at a general population. Wow. If someone is interested in starting a group, what, what would you recommend? I think it's important to think ahead of time about how you want to lead the group um, and what kind of leader you feel you would be. Mm -hmm. it's, it's helpful to know some about mood disorders, um, to, to know about your own depression or bipolar disorder, and to be able to recognize what's going on with other people so that if anyone is by chance ever having a really hard time, you recognize it and you can mm -hmm. help out. Um, Whatever you know about writing is, is wonderful, but I don't think that that's uh, absolutely crucial to, to mm -hmm. be a writer professionally or anything like that, mm -hmm. um, but, but studying it only helps. And any experience you've had facilitating or teaching anything is mm -hmm. a help. But I think the most important thing that all of those uh, feed into is keeping the, the environment safe for people, mm -hmm. making sure that everyone respects one another, mm -hmm. that the, the group stays confidential, mm -hmm. and uh, that people are, are truly respecting one another. Is it important that people have to share what they've written, or does it work without sharing to, or does it depend? It, it depends, and different people have different, um, different opinions on that. Mm -hmm. I think it depends on what is most comfortable for you. We generally, after we write for 10 or 15 minutes in the group, we go around the, the table and read aloud what we've written. But there's a, an important rule that you never have to read. You can always just say pass and there are no questions asked. Mm -hmm. um, that helps people, especially at the beginning when they've just joined the group, to, to feel comfortable before they feel like they're, they're needing to share. Mm -hmm. Some people feel that sharing is the most valuable part to them, mm -hmm. however, and mm -hmm. um, some professional writers also feel that until they've shared something, it's not a real piece of writing. Mm -hmm. So it, it really um, varies, but I encourage people, if they've been completely quiet for several weeks, to go ahead and, and push themselves a little bit and, and try out reading some of what they've written. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to, to talk to one of the women, Bill, who's here with us today about your experiences, Bill. So. so tell us a little bit about yourself, what your situation, how you managed, happened to join Death's group. Well, about 30 years ago, I was diagnosed as being bipolar. And then they called it manic depressive. Mm -hmm. I think now we're consumers. But at any rate, a friend of mine who was a, uh, a counselor saw one of Beth's flyers uh, at Stanford, and she mentioned it to me. And I thought, well, I'm not a scholar. I certainly don't know how to write stuff. And I was kind of shy about pursuing it. But once I got into the group, I realized that this type of writing is just a free flow of ideas. And you don't have to be concerned with punctuation or spelling. Mm -hmm. Just as long as you can make sense of it, that's all that's necessary. Mm -hmm. So that's what got me started. Once you got started, did writing come easy? To you, or is it something that you had to struggle with? Actually, I enjoyed it. I was surprised because uh, mm -hmm. I never enjoyed school all that much. <laughs> but um, in the group, especially, uh, I got to know people who were in a similar situation to my own, mm -hmm. and I got to hear their experiences and opinions, and that was very helpful. Also, 
being able to express things in a safe place with other individuals who actually could understand what you're talking about because mm -hmm. the average layperson that hasn't been through it no. uh, doesn't have any clue as to what you're talking about, really. How long have you been in the group? How many years? I was trying to figure that out. I, I think it's about five years now, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it seems like yesterday. <laughs> yeah. So what keeps you coming back? Well, I'm kind of a recluse by nature, mm -hmm. and I live up on top of a mountain, and I stay to myself. And one of the things that's really beneficial is to come down into a group and and participate in a group setting because mm -hmm. that's something I never did as a kid. Mm -hmm. And um, the writing itself is is giving me a better perspective on the illness. It's like mm -hmm. I don't assume that I am bipolar. I assume that I'm dealing with bipolar. Mm -hmm. The writing has given me some detachment. I know you have a couple of different selections that Beth included in her book. Would you like to read them for us? Sure. Okay. The topics we write on very often don't have anything to do with depression. Mm -hmm. and, um, but it does bring up stuff. It, it, for me, it brought up um, what do I really believe? What's my philosophy of life? Things mm -hmm. like that. And this first one was um, we were to write about the big questions. Uh -huh. And um, so that put me in sort of a philosophical mode. And um, for me, uh, the big questions are who am I and what am I doing here? The question of who we are causes me to look into quantum physics and Vedanta, which is Eastern philosophy. They both say that all of what we are seems to come from a single source, which appears as different forms, much like water, which can be appreciated as steam or as ice, while it still remains H2O. We are really forms made up of a common stuff called being or consciousness. Being unfamiliar with that causes us to believe that we are separate individuals, unconnected. I say this from only brief experiences of the inner self, which we all are, but we could think of it like a movie, which is only an illusion and our consciousness as the screen that allows the show to be seen. But to recognize this intellectually is not enough to satisfy us. We need to know this by being it. Life would still have its changes and ups and downs, but our fulfillment would always be present as the constant serenity of our own being. This is not anything new. It has been experienced by fortunate people throughout the ages. They have tried to pass this message on to others. And some people listen and learn to live this reality and pass it on to still others. The invitation is open to all. I hope we all see the truth of it, as it will lead to fulfillment for all who claim it. Wow, that's really profound. Well, it's, it's, it's not me. It's stuff that I've learned over the years from yeah. people who are very wise. Yeah. And um, they come from all different walks of life. Yeah. So I can see it too. In, in your group, that's a gift to give all the other members of the group to be able to hear something like that, you know? It's that you're not only helping yourself, but, you know, enriching the others that are there as well. I think any of the progress we make gives hope. Mm -hmm. And people who are experiencing depression, that's usually the first thing that goes. Yeah. They become hopeless and thinking there's nothing that can be done. Yeah. And so when someone has some progress, it's like it uplifts yeah, they, the whole group. Exactly. And then they think, oh, maybe I think it's better, too. <laughs> right. <laughs> maybe, you know, right. Some, which is a little contagious there, which is right. kind of contagious. wonderful. <laughs> you want to have. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, the other angle, too, is that it takes my mind off of depression. Mm -hmm. And I'm focusing on something entirely different. Right. And sure, the depression is still there, but I'm not minding it. Right. right. You know, it's just not as overshadowing. Yeah. Did you have another one? Uh, the other article that, that uh, Beth included was um, we were to write about a dream. And um, we do that often, actually. Uh, my favorite dream is one of flying. I used to have it often and hated to wake up. Perhaps I was a bird in a previous life. I hate airplanes, so cramped and noisy. They can't compare to levitating over the countryside in silent comfort. Maybe it is desire to rise above the mundane problems of being earthbound 
and realize that we are capable of much more joy and lightness than we presently are experiencing. Maybe the dream is just an expression of a deep desire to be free of gravity, or perhaps to be like some reptiles who transcended crawling and walking and grew feathers and wings to become birds. And the nice thing about writing this stuff is that it doesn't have to be polished or edited. Yeah, you know, it's right. just what's occurring to us at the time. Right. And everybody understands that it's not an art form, it's just a stream of consciousness. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you ever use writing outside of the group? Not a lot, but lately I've taken up a book about um, codependency. Mm-hmm. And it has a paragraph or two, and then there's a space actually in the book to write, oh. which is a real encouragement. So I usually write what I'm feeling or thinking at the time when I read that. Mm-hmm. And uh, I do that in the morning uh, before I do anything else, and uh, it's good. It, it, it allows me to look at the problems I'm having in a more objective way. I thought what we would do now is is practice this a little bit. Okay. And so what I'd like to invite Beth to do is to give us um, a topic to write about and some of the ground rules when we first start writing. And then we'll have us write something and then we'll read it to each other if we feel like doing that. So okay. <laughs> that's our, our ex- experiential component of this show. Okay. It's important to try, if you can, and this takes, takes some practice sometimes, try to write continuously and for the whole time that you set aside for yourself. So if you say I'm going to write for three minutes or ten minutes or twenty minutes, try to keep your hand uh, writing that whole time, even if you need to go back and repeat what you've said. Uh, it tends to get to a little uh, deeper and more creative part of you than if you stop to edit and think, well, okay, what do I want to say next? So it's good to try to keep going. Uh, remember that this is for you. As, as Bill mentioned, you don't need to worry about spelling or punctuation, but you also don't need to worry about, oh, how is so-and-so going to react when I read this? You can decide after you've written it if you choose to share it with anyone. Okay. Um, and finally, if it feels really overwhelming for some reason, don't write about it. Not at that time, anyway. Well, I thought we could do kind of a reflective exercise, and that is describe an activity that you find soothing. An activity you find soothing. So, let's see who wants to share first. I'm happy to start. Okay. One thing that soothes me is being in a beautiful place in the natural world. I love to hike, and I find nature is something that lifts my spirits and grounds my thoughts. Stopping at the top of a hill to admire a view, or sitting beside a stream or a group of wildflowers, soothes my soul when I'm down or depressed brings me joy, perspective, and the hiking primes those endorphins that make us feel healthier, healthier and more energized, too. Very good. Outdoors, an outdoor scene there, the na- nature is so healing in so many ways, I yeah. think. Yeah. But very calming. Would you like to share that? Sure. For myself, I like to sail. So when there's a steady breeze and a calm sea, It is very relaxing as the sails and the boat do all the work. But sometimes there are large swells and a stiff breeze, and then it requires more attention to sail the boat. But as you get used to this, it can also be very captivating and relaxing. And the relaxation occurs as you come off the wind and sail toward home. It's an accomplishment to enjoy. Okay, here's my, the word soothing, immediately makes me think of bubble bath. I can imagine the warm water filling the tub with more and more bubbles arising. Then I envision 
putting out my putting my toe ginger, gingerly into the water to see if it's the right temperature. When it feels right, I step into the tub and sit down. Laying in the tub is such a pleasure. I don't want to get out. Afterwards, I feel so relaxed, so soothed. I think I'll try this again. <laughs> I'd like to leave us with some resources. We mentioned Beth's book, Writing Through the Darkness, Easing Your Depression with Paper and Pen. She also has a, a website, which is writingthroughthedarkness.com. I was going to uh, tell the people that are watching about your group if they're interested. It's one to three from Stanford University and free of charge. That's and right, it's free. In order to sign up and register for it, people need to call you. Right. Are there any requirements that they have to fulfill or anything? We, we ask that people do have a, a mood disorder of some type. Um, mm -hmm. uh, occasionally people with other uh, related mental illnesses will, will join us. Um, but uh, we we want to keep the group um, one where everyone is is on similar footing. Right, right. Um, there are some other books that Beth has recommended. One is called Writing to Heal, a guided journal for recovering from trauma and emotional upheaval, by James W. Pennebaker. Next. The Way of the Journal, a journal therapy workbook for healing by Kathleen Adams. And then finally, The Artist's Way, a spiritual path to higher creativity by Julia Cameron with Mark Bryan. So all of those are recommended ways of exploring this topic for yourself. I'd like to thank you, Beth and Bill, for being on the show. Thank you. And um, I'll close with the words of the Reverend Wayne Arneson. Take courage, friends. The way is often hard. The path is never clear, and the stakes are very high. Take courage. For deep down, there is another truth. You are not alone. Thank you for watching. I want to see you next time.